Hello, everyone. Um, thank you so much for joining for our latest uh, filmmaker Q&A as part of the Carla Kuhn Memorial Speaker Series. My name is Sohail, and it's my pleasure to introduce today's guest speaker, um, writer, director Ken Quapas. Um, Ken has been directing films and TV series since the mid 1980s, and he's the author of a brand new book. But what I really want to do is direct lessons from a life behind the camera. There it is right there. Um, we're excited to have Ken with us in conversation with our producing faculty member and programming committee member, uh, Jack Leshner. Before I hand it off to them, I wanted to quickly plug our other Carla Kuhn Q&A this week. On Friday, we will have a Q&A with writer-director Chaiko Omawale on her 2018 film called Solace. Chaiko most recently directed an episode of Ava DuVernay's series, Queen Sugar. Um, you all should have gotten an email with a link to watch Solace for free. Um, and it, that also includes the Zoom link for the Q&A, which is this Friday at uh, 2 p.m. Eastern. Um, one final note, Ken has graciously given us permission to record this session and share the recording publicly. Um, so just as a note, if you wanna ask a question but do not wanna appear in the recording, um, which will likely end up on the School of the Arts' YouTube channel, all you have to do is turn off your camera when you ask the question. Otherwise, you won't appear in the recording unless you're speaking. Um, so with that, I want to thank you again for joining. And I will pass it off to today's moderator, Professor Jack Legner. Thank you so much, Sahail. Uh, and thank you for everything you do. Um, and thanks to uh, Ken for agreeing to do this. Thanks, so um, I have to start by just saying how much I enjoyed and appreciated your book. Uh, I think a lot of people in the program, especially directing students, will know uh, Sidney Lumet's book, Making Movies, which is really, of all director memoirs and director books to date, probably the most useful in terms of uh, actually getting on your feet and directing something. And there hasn't been another book that followed on to that level of detail and idea until this one. And because you're a very different filmmaker than Sidney Lumet, you've had a different kind of career. I think it goes in all kinds of directions that making movies did not. So it's it's a new and valuable addition to the bookshelf. And uh, I'm, I don't want to spend our whole conversation just rehashing things that are already in the book, because I really want to encourage everyone to get the book and read the book. Um, but there are some things that are in the book that are just so great that they're, they're worth talking about. Um, uh, ju just to start out, um, can we just uh, like go back in time a little? And can you talk about uh, you know how you got started in this business? You know, uh, you went to USC Film School. What was your process that got you to USC? And what was your process at USC? Well, I, I actually, as an undergrad, I, I studied film at Northwestern University. This is in the late 1970s, and I would say I loved it. And and I would say the focus at Northwestern, uh, Northwestern was a little bit more, you know, history, criticism, and theory. There were certainly production classes, but again, there, there was a lot more history and theory, which I loved. And then after that, I went to USC, which, although they have wonderful history and criticism classes, the opposite is the case there. It's like a, as many of you, you know, probably know, it's like a, a it's a, a, it's about production. So I feel like in a weird way, I had, I had the you know, kind of the best of both. I made a student film in 1982 that won the Student Academy Award. Now, I don't wanna say that that film launched my career, but it did actually help me get an agent. And at the time in 1982, you may not believe this, but I had no clue what an agent was or what they did. <laughs> Sometimes I still wonder, but I did get an agent and my agent, um, helped me land my first job as a director soon out of, uh, you know, soon thereafter, I, I directed, you know, they don't make these anymore, but in the late seventies and early eighties, there were uh, film, short films on television for young people called after school specials. Mm -hmm. you know, some of them were kind of focused on, you know, they, they were sometimes issue oriented. They were like, they were an hour long, uh, not prime time. They usually ran like a three or four in the afternoon. And I got a job directing an after school special, uh, but it was actually one after school specials were made by ABC. What I directed was CBS, 
wanting to you know have their own version of the after school special created something a short lived series called the afternoon playhouse so my debut as a professional director in 1983 was directing the cbs afternoon playhouse so that's the and can you remember what that experience was of jumping from having made short films in, in school to to actually working on a professional set for the first time well, one thing that was one thing that was uh, good in terms of certain kind of continuity was we shot the afternoon playhouse in sixteen millimeters, so I at least felt like I wasn't intimidated by a whole new bunch of you know kinds of equipment. And it was it was a this union no longer is, exists, but it was the union was NABIT, right, you know, which got merged into um, IA. IA, but at the time it was kind of like I don't know, it felt like the young kind of like you know kind of the hippie union to me maybe in I'm the not... old days folks you used to have uh, two crew unions you had nabit for television and ia for film uh and nabit was also heavier on the east coast right uh right. and then uh yeah they, they eventually merged because it was frankly crazy to have two unions well the the reason i mention it in answer to your question was it was a younger a younger group they mm -hmm. were all so i felt like i I was I was still the youngest person on the crew, but it it didn't feel like I was suddenly thrown into a group of old timers. It was it, it was a relatively young crew, and um, and I would say that you know I I I mean I I felt like I had a certain amount of freedom to to direct partly because these afternoon playhouse episodes or after school specials were definitely under the radar. You know, they, I think I, I, you were able to kind of, as a director, kind of succeed, succeed or fail in relative anonymity. You know, but it, so for me, it was a great way to kind of just develop a craft. And and I'm sure that you guys all talk about this, but there, you know, there aren't really obvious uh, areas where you can sort of begin as a director. You know, it, again, in, in in kind of like the old B movie way, where you could start, you know, mm -hmm. doing things that were not kind of you know, in the spotlight a little bit, so you can kind of figure out how to do your do your craft. So, anyways, that's that that those are the beginnings. And and how did you get from that to uh, your first feature? Well, the I directed two of those. I directed one afternoon playhouse, one after school special, and both of them were seen by an executive at Warner Brothers. This is a, again the early nineteen eighties, and Warner Brothers had decided to collaborate with Jim Henson and the Children's Television Workshop, the, the producing entity that created Sesame Street, to, to make the first feature film starring the Sesame Street characters. That film is Sesame Street Presents Follow That Bird. And I never in my wildest dreams imagined that my feature <laughs> debut would be directing an eight foot bird. But it was, but but I I the door opened and I walked right in and I talk at length about follow that bird in the book and I will mention that um, among the many people I needed to meet to get that job was Jim Henson and I was uh, I I sat down in his office uh, and, and and I'll just give you the let me just set the scene a little bit. He has this very posh office on the Upper East Side, but he's like this totally kind of low-key guy. He's wearing jeans. He's very lanky. Uh, and sitting between us was a coffee table, and there was nothing on the coffee table except there's like this clump of green cloth sitting in one corner. So, anyways, I I I said to Jim early on in the interview, I said, you know, I don't have any experience directing puppets. I don't really know how to direct a puppet. And I remember at the time feeling like maybe the meeting will go totally south at this point. I just basically admitted <laughs> that I don't have maybe the most important skill. I don't know how to work with puppets. And Jim was so gracious. He simply said, um, just, just talk to the puppeteers like they're actors. And then he reached over. I promise this is the truth. He grabbed the, here's a piece of felt right here. He grabbed the little piece of green felt. He put his hand in it and it was Kermit. And so he sat there and, and by the way, I'm doing, a, if you are a, a Muppet enthusiast, many of the Muppets have foam core heads, but Kermit is all about Jim's knuckles. 
mm-hmm. and actually he, he's man you know so it, uh, like literally um he he started talking to me as kermit and i was like i felt like i was like a five-year-old <laughs> i was like so mystified um and in fact the meeting did not go off the rails it went very well he jim was he made one demand of me and he made it right there and then he actually said he, he pretty much kind of gave me the job in the moment and he said, Ken, here's the only thing I'm going to insist that you do on day one of shooting. He said, I want you to gather the crew, get everyone in a circle, and ask everyone to raise their hand in the air and hold it there for one solid minute. And I wasn't sure what he was getting at, but he told me. He said he wanted all the crew members to understand and be sensitive to how difficult it is for the puppeteers to basically keep their hand in the air while you're doing like umpteen lighting and cam, you know, lighting and camera adjustments. And because the like, puppeteers tend to be sort of underneath the set. They're under out. the set, yeah. Or in the case of Carol Spinney, he's in the he's in the bird suit, and and so uh, that, so I I said absolutely I will do that. And so day one, I had a group of like forty or so crew members gathered around. Nobody quite knew what the hell was going on. And I asked them to all raise one hand in the air and hold it for a solid minute. A minute can be a long time when you're holding your hand up in the air. Mm-hmm. So that was that is the uh, that's the first feature film experience i had i i so now of course you're working in 35 you've got a you know ia crew you've got uh you know the whole works it's a studio had, movie you know i didn't talk i didn't write about this but i want to share this with you i i had a lot of i had a lot of grand ambitions for this film and i wanted it to look unlike a muppet movie or un, most importantly unlike the television show sesame street which is you know a fan, it's an amazing show but it's it's lit and it's shot in a very i'll say pedestrian way i hope nobody here gets upset by my i don't think it, anyone will argue with you on this point the what i don't think anyone will argue on this point <laughs> well i wanted it ha- i wanted the film to have a very strong look so for starters i enlisted a a very fine production designer named carol spear out of Toronto, whose work uh, mainly had been with the director David Cronenberg, of all people. And I think the <laughs> film that she had just finished with him was, oh gosh, just the one with Jeremy Irons playing the twin gynecologist. Uh, Dead Ringers. <laughs> Dead Ringers. And, uh, and, and then to shoot the film, I enlisted a, uh, a cinematographer. Again, I, I, I'm proud of these choices because they really, these two people brought a lot to the film. I enlisted the cinematographer Curtis Clark, who not a lot of people know, but at the time in the 80s, he was known for having uh, worked on films like The Draftsman's Contract. So he actually, he had done some very, um, what's the right way to put it? Some very striking art films. And that one in particular, uh, Peter Greenaway, the director, it's a very, you know, every composition is sort of very, Christine, uh, exactly. And, and so those two people were my chief uh, allies putting the film together. And I, I feel very proud of how the film looks. It, it's got a rich look to it. Um, I watched it again for this and uh, something you talk about in the book, but that anyone in this program will recognize is at one point, uh, Big Bird is uh, lost in the middle of a cornfield and Ernie and Bird are flying a plane to try and find him. <laughs> And you recreate the crop duster sequence from North by Northwest, shot for shot. Shot for shot. Not that any of the member of the target audience would know <laughs> what the hell it meant, but but no. But I well, so Jack, I want to. So I'm going to jump in and talk about the, the, the real turning point in Follow That Bird because, and this this is something I trust that many of you, especially if you're aspiring directors, will relate to. When I I um, I came out of film school very, feeling very confident about how to visualize things, how to set a shot, how to choreograph action. I felt very, like pictorially, I felt very confident. Well, I really didn't know much about, I didn't know much about the acting process at all, to be honest. And I really didn't, I think that I have my whole approach to film was very kind of formal and I don't want to say superficial, but in a way it was kind of superficial. So Big Bird is the star and the main character of this story. And at first 
I really thought of Big Bird mainly as like an exotic pictorial object, an eight foot <laughs> object that I had to figure out how to, you know, you know, film and how to stage scenes with, you know, human beings or puppets who would only be like that much in your frame and an eight foot object. And what, what happened though, over, you know, soon into the shooting of the film is that I had a kind of epiphany, I guess. I had really underwent a kind of transformation in my thinking because I started to get more connected emotionally with Big Bird, emotionally with the journey that Big Bird is on in the story. And I don't know if many of you have seen the film, but it's actually quite a, you know, it's actually a very relevant, uh, it's a message movie. It's a very relevant film in a way. It it's, about, it's about, you know, Big Bird deciding that he would be better off living with his own kind, other birds. So he leaves Sesame Street and moves in with a foster bird family only to discover the fact that he misses Sesame Street and more specifically, or more importantly, he misses the diversity of Sesame Street, humans, monsters, grouches, all, you know. And so he embarks on this uh, track to get back to Sesame Street. And I felt that as the shoot progressed, I got more and more connected with Big Bird's emotional arc and Big Bird soon became less of an object and more of the subject of the film. And that's actually this, it was a key turning point for me. And I, the way I describe it in the book is I say that it took an eight foot bird to, to teach me that my job as a director was really to be a good student of human nature. And, and, I, and that really was, uh, you know, again, I, it, it, I feel very blessed that uh, I had that transformative experience with the Muppets of all <laughs> So, but, I, but I'm proud of the film. And by the way, one of the things I do talk about in the book, which I, I, for some of you may be aspiring writers or aspiring writer directors, uh, I, I actually learned a lot about character development from the Muppets. And it, it seems very, I, I, I promise I'm not making a joke, but characters like the Count, or Cookie Monster, they're so well drawn. They're so sharply defined. They want one thing. They don't want <laughs> Cookie Monster. Does not want a milkshake. He wants. He doesn't want a cheeseburger. He wants one thing. And it seems like okay. Well, you may say okay, that's not good character writing. But I would argue that over the decades since then, I have directed so many stories with characters that are so flabbily drawn that may have funny things to say now and then, but have no need that's driving them. And it's like, pfft, I, I'm sorry, we, I, you, could, you could do worse than coming up with a character like the Count who has this monomaniacal <laughs> obsession with numbers. And, and by the way, what I also have thought a lot about over the years, because I've worked on comedic material, is one of the great things about a good, a well-drawn comedic character is not only do they have a kind of very fixed um, point of view about things, but it's it's almost like they're so committed, they're committed to that point of view almost to the uh, to to the to, to the expense of with everything to a fault, <laughs> literally yeah, to a fault. And I, I so again, I I think that you know when in doubt, you know. It, 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 you're nice. right. It's actually part of what <laughs> makes them comic characters is because they are committed to their obsession, regardless of the context. And regardless and, uh, of, yeah, you know, they, they, as, as in Follow That Bird, where Cookie Monster ends up eating most of a Volkswagen, right. uh, just, you know, starting with the hubcaps. I, I um, so anyways, I, I, I'm not making a big plug for you to watch Follow That Bird, but I will say it, it, it has values that um, are, are pretty strong, both cinem cinematically emo and emotionally. And also I, I, I will say it, it's kind of a, you know, in a day and age when, you know, we, we see so many politicians in, encouraging distrust of outsiders, I actually think it's a not insignificant story. So. It's true. So something that I think a lot of uh, students here are, are thinking about, which is, you know, 
I've already had this conversation with some students where they talk about worrying about being pigeonholed in one genre or another. You know, you made a successful family movie. Were you then pigeonholed as a director of kids movies? Was it hard to get an adult movie after that? Well, yes and no. I mean, I think that um, I think that I've all I've I've tried over the years to not be pigeonholed in, in any genre. I mean, there were definitely I mean, it wasn't like suddenly I was flooded with other puppet movies. There weren't that many. Right. But, you know, but I do think that, um, yeah, I can't, you know, it, it, it's easy for people to say, oh, he did that well. So let's give him something so he can repeat what he already did well. So my, you know, I would say that, um, I mean, among the many challenges is, is not sort of, uh, I mean, by the way, you can repeat yourself endlessly as long as you, have a passion for you know doing that same kind of thing over and over again. We know Frank Darabont all... made two Stephen King prison movies back Absolutely. to back. Yeah, I mean we've obviously you know we all you know know directors from you know from the history of the movies who love a you know Martin Scorsese loves gangster movies, but he certainly has a wide variety of things that he's mm -hmm. also interested in. So for me, it was it, I would say that for me, my biggest challenge was as somebody who was thought of as having a skill directing comedic material was to find ma material that um, was not simply comedic but smart actually you know what can i can i take that and please. run with that for a second Jane? please because when i was a when i was a, a new director in the 1980s i i had a real bias against television directing and, uh, and 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 as did many of my peers coming out of film school. I mean, there was a there was a general feeling that if you were and I don't write about this actually in the book, but if, there was a feeling among my peers that if you were a television director, like huh, good luck, good luck getting a feature made. And if you were a yeah. feature director, why would you possibly want to direct television of all things? So obviously, I don't need to tell any of you that that has changed a thousand percent. It has indeed. And but I can tell you that for me there was a there was a a turning point in terms of my appreciation of television that came in the early '90s, and what I, I had made two or three feature films, and was struggling to uh, get another one made, when I received in the mail a a, a half hour television comedy script. And I almost didn't even open the envelope because I thought, oh my gosh, here it is, the slippery slope. If I take this job, you know, <laughs> you'll no never get back to features. No one will take me seriously as a feature director, but I did open it and I did read it. And it was the pilot of the Larry Sanders show for HBO. So that was the first television episode you directed? Um, well, the series? I, the only thing I had done, no, I had done a couple of things before, but really not much at all. And and wow. that was, it was certainly the first pilot I was ever mm -hmm. shown. And, and, and let's just talk about that for a moment, because, uh, you know, people who haven't worked in television might not know, there's a big difference between directing a pilot and directing an episode of an established series. What, I, I what, would, what are the specific yeah. challenges of creating a pilot? Well, I'm going to, I'll jump ahead because I, I did help launch a show that I know many of you are, are familiar with. I, I directed the pilot of the show, The Office. So part of the job of directing, setting, you know, launching that show was casting, putting the cast together. Again, not, I'm not alone doing it, but I'm definitely overseeing the casting process. The other um, thing that the pilot director does is help design the the look of the show so the even though the office was adapted from a british show it was it fell to me to sort of figure out the american visual look of that show i mean clearly it's quite it, different it's a it, it's different i mean it's obviously a show with a very simple and, and distinct visual concept it's a fake documentary so every in theory every shot choice should reinforce this illusion that there's a documentary team sort of, you know, roaming around this fictional paper company, you know, documenting the lives of the paper company employees. The other thing that was very important as a, as a pilot director is you set up the physical space that the story takes place in. So for me, I, one of the things I was in charge of was the design of the Dunder Mifflin bullpen 
and I've talked, I talk about this in the book where, you know, there were so many questions that came up. Should it be an open plan or should the characters work in cubicles? Uh, how do characters face each other in the space? How can that help tell the story? Should Jim, I mean, I'm, again, I'm trusting that many of you know the show. I think should everyone has watched The Office. Jim and, should Jim and Dwight face each other like this or like that? You know, it's like, and, and, and again, I talk about this in some detail, but when it came to the very important relationship between Pam and Jim, you know, I knew that Pam's desk was, her reception desk was always going to face the bullpen, but the question was, should Jim face her? And I decided that it was better if he were actually in profile to her so that in, in a sense that she was always looking at him. She always looks at Jim. But for, for Jim to look at her, he needs to make an effort and look her away. And, and what that, and this is going back to your question, Jack, about what does a pilot director do? One of the things that hopefully a pilot director does is create signature images for the series as a whole. And I'm gonna see if I can act this out a little bit. Uh, <laughs> um, if I'm Jim, you know, in the background, oh, that looks pretty good. There's like, you know, Pam is back there. Yeah. So a lot of, there are a lot of shots in the early episodes of the show where, where we had this very kind of distinct signature image of Krasinski, John Krasinski in profile in the foreground and, and Jenna in the background. And either Krasinski is aware she's looking at him or is pretending to not be, it was just a variety. But anyways, the main thing is going back to what does a pilot director do? It came, it, it fell to me to figure out how these characters relate in space and how that would, I had to imagine how that would both help tell their story and, and how it would work over time. And uh, you and Greg Daniels, the showrunner made some fairly radical decisions for a pilot then or now. You know, you uh, you cast people who would not traditionally be the leads in a network series. It was a very it was very important. I mean, and I have to give all credit to Greg because he was the one who convinced NBC that this show wouldn't would not work if it behaved like a, a typical broadcast network comedy. In Where everyone's many, beautiful, for one thing. Everyone's beautiful. In fact, so much of the. Um, you know, the idea, the, the casting director, Allison Jones, who's, who, this, this is especially of hers, by the way, just finding, you know, people who are not glamorous, but are wonderful. Uh, you know, the idea, yeah, she's, she, she, um, just a quick sidebar about Allison. Allison cast a show that I did not help launch, but I did direct a couple episodes of. She cast Freaks and Geeks. And one of the great, I remember talking to her when I was working on the show and she said that the casting philosophy of Freaks and Geeks was to cast all the actors who, nor, who get all the way, but don't quite get cast normally. <laughs> they, they also ran. So the ones who were like the backup choice if somebody can't be in it. So all of those people, the Linda Cardellinis of the world, the James Francos of the world, the, the, the thought was- Seth Rogen, you know, it just goes on and on. Uh, uh, Jason Siegel. Jason Siegel, but these were the ones who weren't quite, they didn't quite have that TV thing. And so they never would get cast. Because they were actually with, individuals as opposed to absolutely. being off the rack. Absolutely. And so the idea was gather those and create an ensemble. Now with The Office, it was, the goal was, you know, apart from Steve Carell, who was known, but not, not widely known. The idea was that you, if you turn down the show, you should feel that you're watching a documentary. And not, you know, so the idea was that pe the, pe the people cast in the show should not look like they belong on primetime network television. And um, which I think is wonderful. So, I mean, I think uh, um, in terms of the look, in terms of diversity of looks, size diversity, everything, there's like a lot of, um, there's, a, there's a lot of sense that you're just, you know, eavesdropping on a real environment with real people. So again, again, I give all credit to Greg for convincing a network that it wouldn't work unless it behaved in a different way. But and I want it's, to go it's kind of striking because uh, it's hard to remember now, but at the time you had, you know, in the early uh, 70s, you had a whole spate of British shows being successfully adapted to American television, mm -hmm. like All in the Family and Sanford and Son and Three's yeah. Company. But then you had 20, 25 years of a desert in which 
again, dozens of shows were adapted and none of them worked. And oh, almost every season you'd have a, a, an adaptation of a British show. Oh, Faulty yeah. Towers was adapted three different times and it never oh, wow. worked. Wow. And The Office broke that streak. It was the first successful adaptation of a British show in I think 30 years. Again, I, I feel like the, the you know, I, I feel like, well, just, just to put The Office into a little bit of context, um, I feel like I benefited from in the late 90s, in, in the early aughts, you know, that there was a there was suddenly an appetite on the on on an appetite from the broadcast networks for half hour stories that were not done in front of a live audience, mm -hmm. so-called single camera comedies, film, you know, shows that 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 exhibited you know cinematic style. And, and had no to, you may not blow your horn, but I will say some of that is the direct ripples from the Larry Sanders show, which you did the pilot of at HBO. Well, I think that, I mean, the Larry's, well, okay, it's a circle back to Larry Sanders. And again, if you haven't seen the show, I would say, I'll, I'll, I don't want to just plug my own work, but the Larry Sanders show, and again, I'm not patting it right. on the back, is actually important to see. And I feel it's actually, in, in I, I, it is, I think it is like, it was the harbinger of a lot of today's more tonally complex shows like you know whether yep. it's you know fleabag or or atlanta or shows like that mm -hmm. i mean i think you can trace a line from some of the more uh, tonally challenging shows of today back to larry sanders which unquestionably uh, which, which had among other things well one of the many unique things about it was it was you know the the characters in it were people who actually behaved more often than not quite reprehensibly this is a story about a talk show, um, uh, the Larry Sanders show. Uh, Larry Sanders is played by Gary Shandling, and you're constantly cutting back and forth between the show itself, shot on videotape as a traditional talk show, and what's going on behind the scenes, shot on film as a single character, uh, you know, observational comedy. Sure, and, and shot on 16 millimeter to heighten the contrast between the two modes. So you had like, one inch probably one inch tape whatever whatever you know whatever a show like the tonight show was uh, taped on constantly intercut with you know kind of pretty grainy 16 millimeter and so there was always this kind of great energy that came as a result of intercutting those two uh form formats modes what um and but but i would say what when i to go back to that kind of pivotal moment when i got was handed this script and i almost didn't want to read it i did read it and what knocked me out was uh, it felt like nothing that was on a TV show right now. It, it felt like it felt like no half hour television show I'd read or one that was on the air. But more importantly, it, it felt different from anything in the movie theaters. Mm -hmm. It felt it felt like these were there were there was something going on in this pilot script that was it was more sophisticated, more challenging than any comedy playing in movie theater at that time, mm -hmm. to me, for me. And I thought, wow, these guys who wrote this, Gary Shandling, Dennis Klein, these guys are kind of reinventing the game here. And I just jumped on it. Um, so I feel like what, again, going back to this question about, or this issue of my bias against TV, what I, what I have found is, I well, and I also feel like I, you know, benefited from this, you know, with the rise of cable networks and now in the post cable streaming era, wow, they, the half hours format has changed so radically. I mean, there's the, the, the kinds of content and, and uh, you know, the kind of, again, I, I keep repeating myself, tonally challenging shows. I worked on an Amazon show a couple of years ago that I'm very proud of. I don't know if a lot of people saw it called One Mississippi very that's personal. Tignataro's show Tignataro's show very mm -hmm. personal and dealt with some very difficult material you know from her life including uh you know breast cancer issues like the sexual molestation of children all things were that could not be more you know <laughs> out not funny you wouldn't find in any broadcast network comedy. And yet, uh, I mean, Tig, Tig described the show when I first talked to her about it as a tromedy. So, <laughs> <laughs> but anyways, I, again, not to go on and on about Larry Sanders, but I think historically you can kind of 
trace a line back to that show, which started in the early 90s on HBO, which really was, and again, I feel just you know, fortunate that I was there, a part of something that broke new ground. So um, by the way, I've, I've got a million questions, but I just want to encourage everyone, sure. um, if you've got a question, please, you, you can either use the hand raise function on participants, or you can uh, just type your question into the chat. But please feel free to ask a question at any time. Um, but uh, I want to ask you, because uh, you there are four kinds of movies, and you've made every kind. Oh. There are movies <laughs> that get great reviews and make money, like mm -hmm. Sisterhood of the Traveling Pants. There are movies that get great reviews and don't make money, like Big Miracle. Mm -hmm. uh, there are movies that make money and don't get great reviews, like License to Wed. Mm -hmm. And there are movies that don't make money and don't get great reviews, like Vibes. Mm -hmm. So obviously, everyone's happy when you get a movie that gets great reviews and makes money. And obviously, no one is happy when you have a movie that does neither. But what what about those two middle situations? You know, what's it like when you either make a movie that everyone loves, but it doesn't work financially, or when you make a movie that seems nobody loved, as, as uh, I can't remember who originally said it, no one loves except the audience. <laughs> well, but yes, I'm, I've never heard it broken down like that. Well, that, that's my goal. I wanted to hit all four of those. <laughs> <laughs> Well, director. well, let me, okay, well, this is a broader, I mean, this touches on like the, this actually, that question touches the big themes of the book. So let me, so uh, let me just kind of, I'm going to be a little expansive here and talk about that. Let's go, I want to talk about number four first. Nobody saw it and the reviews were bad because that film Vibes, which came out in 1988, a film I think is wonderful and charming and goofy and stars Cindy Lauper and Jeff Goldblum and Peter Falk. Um, it, it, it really was a, a difficult experience for me after it came out because the reviews were, were so terrible, I couldn't read them. Uh, you know, at, at the time, you know, the, the studio used to send you all the reviews in the form of like photocopies. So I had like a big stack of like the, the worst reviews you could possibly imagine, like sitting on my desk and I debated uh, you know, <laughs> I debated how to dispose of them. I wasn't going to read them. <laughs> I debated whether to burn them. I, had a, I, had a, I, I read a story about a fiction writer who routinely will take his bad reviews and post them to a telephone pole and, and, and use them for target practice. So anyways, I didn't know what to do with these bad reviews. I finally just put them in the, the famous example is I think it was George Bernard Shaw who wrote to one of his critics and said, uh, I'm sitting in the smallest room in my house. I have your review before me. Soon it will be behind me. <laughs> well, I was I have to be honest, I was very uh, uh, taken aback by the negativity and uh, and felt and it was very hurtful uh, to me personally. And I embarked on a research project after that. And it, and it is something I talk about at length in the book. I started asking creative people that I knew or worked with how they dealt with bad notices, how they dealt with bad reviews. And I, and I got a variety of answers, including people who said, well, you know, whatever doesn't you know, kill you makes you stronger or, you know, like, so just read them. And, or, you know, uh, people who say, well, if you believe the good ones, you have to believe the bad ones too. So anyways, I got a variety of responses, but the one thing I definitely discovered was that creative people have a remarkable ability to, to commit to memory, almost word for word, their worst reviews. So like if a hundred people, if a hundred people, well, no, not a hundred, let's say if 99 people say you're beautiful, one person says you're not at length, you will remember that person's review. Right. And, I, and I had this experience where literally I asked people about a bad review and they were able to quote it back. And I thought, oh my God, this is like stuck on their hard drive. And, and, uh, and so I came to the decision that I shouldn't read reviews. And, I, and in the early 90s, mid 90s, I just went on a review free diet because I felt like it was healthier to not really have those words in my head. Now, by the way, of course you can't be unaware of, of which yeah. way the critical winds are blowing. You're a human being in the world. And you know, for instance, I 
and I write about this, when I directed the comedy License to Wed, one of my producers, a wonderful, well-meaning producer, like the morning that the film opened, he emailed me and the subject heading of the email was, fuck the New York Times. So <laughs> I thought, well, I don't, there's no reason I need to open that email, right? <laughs> and, and so there's no way to really insulate yourself so completely, but you can, I think, protect yourself by not having those words in your head. And so over the years, I have um, managed, you know, occasionally I've fallen off the wagon, but I managed to uh, avoid reading my own reviews of my own work. Now that, but that's part one to answer your, your big question. Because the other part of it is this, is, is I feel like there's, um, oh, hold on one second. Oh, somebody was trying to come in my room. Um, I feel like the, what I've you know learned over the years is, forget about reviews for a second, but you can't, critics is just one thing you can't control. You cannot control the critics. You cannot control the box office. You cannot control how many people are gonna tune into your show. Um, and so I feel like over the years I've, I've come to, you know, like, I don't want to get hung up on those outcomes that I have no control over. And, and again, this is the, you know, the, the grand theme of the book is the only thing that you can control is the process of making the thing, the thing itself, the show, the episode, the feature. So why not stay focused on that process? Because it's the only one you can control anyways. So that's and even that you can sometimes barely control. And, you know, you know, and controlling that, but but I would say that that the, what I try and do is from project to project. It, it's it's not like well this time I'm going to get a hit. It's more like this time how can I improve the process, the directing process? And I feel like it it, it look at this. None of this is foolproof, but I feel like if as you become more and more process focused there are certain kind of aspects of you know being in this business like reviews and box office and stuff like that that'll start to make they, they won't you know they you won't be so dependent on those things if you you know so again that's this is like the motivational speech portion of our Q &A. it's a fantastic <laughs> part of the book and uh you know as you say you want to be in the industry but not of the industry you want to be defined by those values I think that even in film school, I mean, this, I actually, I can't take credit for this quote. I heard Paul Schrader once say, you can sell out in film school. <laughs> but I think the bigger issue is, is that if for, in any good film school, like, you know, Columbia's or anywhere that, you know, there's always a sense that it, it, it's sort of, whether it wants to or not, it kind of, you know, it, some schools kind of mimic what the industry is like. And, and mm -hmm. I'm not, I shouldn't say that about Columbia. Yeah, ours does that. not do that. Uh, we actually define ourselves very much as sort of the anti-USC that way. I, I'm very, I'm very happy to hear that. USC mimics the industry. That's right. With all its, and I will just, and look at, I, I obviously am a, I'm a successful product of that school, but I, I will say that that was one aspect of the experience there that was not good. And for me that, you know, I, I much prefer what you're talking about the idea is figure out a way to measure your success on your own terms as opposed to using Hollywood's terms to do it and I think that that starts in film school too so obviously you guys are in the right school so let's uh, let's let's talk about dig into that a little uh, I mean one thing that I didn't learn from the book but I learned from Larry Wilmore's blurb on the book oh yes yeah. you don't say action on the set no, I, you know, here's, this goes again, once again, back to the Larry Sanders show. When, when I was preparing the Larry Sanders show, Gary Shandling had a lot of very unorthodox ideas. And one of them was, he said, Ken, can you come up with a shooting style in, so, uh, such that the actors are never aware whether the cameras are turning or not? And I thought, well, <laughs> I don't know how to, I don't know how to do that. We're shooting film, 16 millimeter. There are magazines that need to be reloaded now and then. I, was, I couldn't come up with a way to actually hide from the cast whether we were actually shooting. So, but what I came up with was the following. I said to Gary, I said, here's what I'll do. 
will dispense with all the kind of shouted commands like you know action or well excuse me not even action you know sound speed. rolling speed exactly yeah. and i'll just go to give a head nod to the two camera operators there were two camera operators at the time handheld 16 millimeter cameras and when they gave me a nod back to let me know that they were rolling i would just turn to gary and the cast but mostly gary and i'd say uh go ahead and and now if gary had the first line in the scene he might launch into the scene but just as likely he might just start talking for a while cameras are rolling and again this isn't digital this is like film <laughs> so the cameras are rolling and gary might turn and tell a joke to the cast and or engage the cast in some chit chat and then just unexpectedly launch into his first line and 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 what it did is it created this wonderful um I don't know, it just, it, 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 it informed the performance style of the show in a way that uh, the line between scene and not scene was erased with this. And then in a macro way, that's also what you did with The Office, where you absolutely. write in the book about starting The Office with just shooting behavior. Well, that was, and then, well, what happened was after the Larry Sanders show, I just adopted Go Ahead as my alternate for saying action, and I haven't said action for about well since the early 90s and but on the office we did we did go one step further only on the pilot but this is worth mm -hmm. sharing with you because i'm very proud of this idea is that every the cast uh, reported to work every day at 7 a.m and went to their desks even if they weren't in the scenes they had to go to work like they were paper company employees they had to sit at their desks all the phones were dummy phones and and um in the morning for about a half hour, the camera operator and myself, we would we would kind of wander through the bullpen and just do like kind of shots of people like at work. There's no nothing scripted. So it might You're be being like the a, documentary. The documentary. It might be like a shot of, you know, Rain Wilson who plays Dwight Schrute, like sharpening pencils. Or it might be Angela Kinsey who plays Angela the accountant, like doodling a picture of her cat. Or it might be like Leslie, who plays Stanley, who's like just standing at the water cooler. And I do remember feeling like the people at NBC were probably looking at all this footage and going, what the hell is this? Why, why are we looking at like 10 minutes of someone sharpening pencils? But what happened is after about a half hour or so, we would then move into a scripted scene. The important thing is that the cast, having been sort of under observation for a half hour or more, as you know, documentary subjects, they kind of retained that sense of being under observation when we went into a scripted scene. So that they're, again, it didn't, the kind of the, the half hour of just doing like basically establishing shots, um, non-scripted establishing shots informed the performance style of the day. So even if they were doing high, and the, the show was very tightly scripted, it wasn't an improvised show at all. Uh, but even, you know, working with tightly scripted scenes, the cast somehow retained that sense of being subjects under observation in a documentary. And of course, one of the things you also had to figure out in that pilot was each character's relation to the documentary crew, uh, right. the way that, you know, famously Jim is always playing to the camera, acknowledging the camera in a way that, uh, you know, uh, some other characters are just oblivious to the camera. Some were oblivious, some are kind of a little bit freaked out by the camera. I would say the original intention with Dr Dwight is that he's he's paranoid about the fact that cameras are there. <laughs> and so they're, you know, so he's constantly sort of looking at the camera a little, you know, giving it sidelong glances to the mm -hmm. camera. Uh, Pam, Jenna Fisher's character is, is, you know, kind of wilts under the camera for a while. Uh, Jim's the only one who kind of like loves the camera. Well, second only to Michael Scott, of course. Mm -hmm. and, and I think over the course of the series, you know, each character started to develop their own particular camera awareness or relationship to the, the camera. And it's funny you mention that because I, I directed the 100th episode of the show and the climax of that episode, it's called Company Picnic. The climax of that episode is when we discover that uh, Pam is pregnant, and there's a scene where you see uh, in, you're in a hospital and you're looking through a glass, the glass in a door, 
at Jim and Pam and a doctor and the doctor's clearly informing, you can't hear it. The doctor's clearly informing the two of them that Pam is pregnant. And then Jim comes out and he looks at the camera to, to basically announce that she's pregnant. And, and I remember it was a tough shot for John Krasinski and I, and I felt like it should be an emotional moment, but I was having a hard time giving him a note that made it that, I don't know, it was a tough one for me. I was, and I finally came up with, and this goes back to your question about camera awareness. I finally said to, J to John, I said, remember that over the past so many years, you've developed a relationship with mm -hmm. this camera operator. Right, so in right. fact, it changed the whole nature of the next take where when he, he was no longer talking to the camera, he was, he was talking to the operator. And by personalizing it and reminding John that ever since the pilot, when he was the first of the ensemble to, to you know, kind of bravely look at the camera, <laughs> he's had a relationship with this operator. And, and so it, and, and it made the, the it, it changed the, the take, it changed the scene really wonderfully. Uh, it humanized it. So. Um, I, again, I've got a million questions, but does anyone have a question they wanna? Uh, uh, Ari, you've got a question. Yeah, I've got one. This is incredible. Thank you so much for, for coming and talking okay. to us. Um, uh, I'm curious, I feel like when I hear about comedy, I think, um, and just naturally, it's like the writers and it's like, who's the, you know, right now it's whatever, Seth Rogen's new movie. I'm, I'm saying that because we mentioned his name before, but like he wrote it and he's in it. And, and there's so much about the writing and the acting of it. And I personally am really, really interested in directing comedy, especially comedy that I didn't write. Can you just talk about like how to invest in that sort of sense of humor, which feels so personal, but oh. as a director who has to sort of climb into that writer's brain or, or utilize that writer's um, sense of humor? Sure. I mean, I think that what I do, and I can't speak for Seth or uh, others, but what I do and this goes back to Jack, what you talked about in terms of not being pigeonholed a little bit. I, when I have a piece of comedic material, what I first try and do is figure out a way to ground it in some reality. That's actually, that's the first challenge for me because you'll, you'll often get a, a wonderfully written piece of material that's on the surface funny, but it has no connection to actually real life or real emotions. So that's step number one. And then, then conversely, if I'm if given a dramatic scene, what I try my best to do is find the humor that's hiding in the drama. And I actually, I, I honestly think that sometimes I, I get a little impatient with drama on TV because I feel like people forget that, well, there's always great humor hiding in there somewhere. It just takes a good director to, to dig it out. So in a weird way, I'm, I'm, I'm again, grounding the humor and finding the humor in, in the drama. And as a result, I, I think of, I try not to think of myself as a comedy director at all. And I try to think of, uh, I, I like to think about, you know, things as being human comedies. It's a, a nice phrase as opposed to like just a comedy. Uh, so it's now in terms of personally personalizing the material, if you as a director, I mean, I, I, it really comes down to one thing. Let's say you're given a script. Um, and it's a comedic script the real question is when you're reading it are you able to put yourself in the shoes of those characters you know uh like me and big bird getting into big birds big <laughs> feet i mean it, but i feel like the the are you able to make a connection um in the book i talk about directing the film he's just not that into you which has nine main characters in it um and what i found when i read it and i've i've read romantic comedy material before but what struck me when i read this it didn't strike me well first it didn't seem like a comedy it actually made me really sad the stories but mostly i felt like i was able to each of those nine characters i was able to draw trace a line from their story to something that i'd done in the past some mistake i'd made some misstep i've made and a, a time when i sent someone mixed signals and i shouldn't have you know so i again I, I felt like when i finally got around to meeting the producers it wasn't a project i developed i was a hired gun on this project but i felt like i was able to talk about it in a very personal way and and i think that's why i 
they, they wanted me to direct it. I basically said, I have to direct this film because I, I feel like I, I need, I almost, I, I remember pitching myself saying, this, this film would be good therapy for me to do. So you should let me do it. <laughs> That's a novel pitch. <laughs> We've got some questions on the chat here. Uh, Oliver asks, um, through uh, directing a pilot of a show like The Office, I imagine you being quite attached to it, designing the world, uh, but uh, you know, you only directed twelve episodes of the series. Do you was there a part of you that wanted to direct more? That uh, you know, did you, did you consider well instead of having this very multifaceted career, maybe I'll just direct this for a while? I I the answer is I I it's not that I'm impatient or restless. I just love the idea of um, trying to go back and forth between features and series that's all and and I, I literally there was that the office you know I, I was able to work on it on it particularly in the first two or to three seasons and 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 worked on some significant episodes particularly a lot of the key Pam and Jim story stories and diversity day which is arguably the the episode where the show took on its own narrative character uh, oh, yeah. beyond that because it didn't have any parallel in the British show. No, I mean, Diversity Day, the second episode was, it, 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 I mean, if Greg Daniels were on this call, he, he might half jokingly say, yeah, we peaked at episode two. <laughs> <laughs> but, the, uh, but I feel like that's, not, it's, I, I certainly know directors who love kind of being part of the family of a series. There's certainly a lot of, you know, there's, there's a lot of satisfying aspects to being part of, you know, an on a group that goes for season to season. But for me, I just want to keep, you know, maybe I'm just restless. I just want to keep going, trying to mix it up a little bit. No, I mean, you it's should not point out that as the director of a pilot, you actually then have a piece of that show. Um, you, you get uh, uh, paid for every episode. Yeah, I mean, I think, that there, yeah, I mean, just from a business standpoint, there's, a, there are, it's, it's never anything uh, quite at the level of if you create a show, but you, you have a certain kind of ownership in, in a show, that's for sure. And then, you know, the, the, but I, again, I feel like on several shows, I, you know, the, a show I'm particularly proud of, the Bernie Mac show, I did 10 episodes. Mm -hmm. and, and again, I was able to, you know, that, that's a case where I, I, again, I left to just do other things, not because I didn't like the show or was bored with it. I just wanted to you know, kind of, keep mixing it up a little bit and and, uh, and then you came back and did the last episode I, I came back and did the series finale and 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 bernie like roasted me in front of the crew and cat because <laughs> i had the audacity to actually leave the show for a while <laughs> so. um annie asks uh um you have such a diverse body of work how do you decide what to work on you have any advice for emerging directors about the work they choose to direct What's most important to you when you're deciding whether or not to take on a new project? Well, I would say, I mean, I'm going to go, well, I'm going to answer that in two ways. One is going back to the CBS Afternoon Playhouse. You know, those those things were like low on the cultural totem pole in a way, you know, and I, I certainly had classmates who were like, no, hold out for your first big feature, et cetera. I, my, I guess my real advice is if there's a door open, I mean, if there's, if it's a piece of material that's like reprehensible, you know, you're not going to direct it, but if the door is open, go through it, you know, you don't know who you're going to meet that's going to end up, you know, I, I it, it's just go through it. Don't worry about whether or not you're, you know, you're, you're coming out of the gate making a, you know, a feature that's going to play at con. It doesn't matter. Just get some directing under your belt. And, and how about once you actually have an established career at this point, clearly, you know, there are things you say no to. What makes you say no to one script and yes to another? Well, this is, I would say I'm going to repeat a little bit the answer I gave to Ari, and that is yeah, I, I read things. And if I don't have an, a human connection to a character or a, a part of this story, I, don't, I won't know how to direct it. And by the way, sometimes I have made the mistake of, you know, sort of, choosing something where and then only after the fact go you know what i'm not really sure how to connect with this material uh it seemed like you no know, the you know it seemed like you know so but i think for now i mean in general even at the start of your career hopefully you'll find something where again you can make a human connection by the way i, I directed this show um uh, for netflix a couple of years ago 
I did a few episodes of it called Santa Clarita Diet. Sure. Oh, it's a zombie show. You know, it's Drew Barrymore and Timothy Oliphant, and she's a, she is a zombie. Uh, I will tell you a funny story about that, by the way. Uh, I had worked with Drew before, and she sent me the pilot, and I and I thought, oh, great, I'll, I'll do a pilot of a zombie show. And then I was turned down. I was passed <laughs> over, and I said to my agent, I go, well, I, not that I care that much, but did they give a reason? And my agent said, yeah, the people at Netflix uh, said that you lacked, quote, zombie cred. <laughs> Which is true. I, I had, and I, and I couldn't argue. I said, it's true. I have none. I have no zombie cred at all. Never directed but, anything like a horror movie. I, but, but, but they said, but, but, but they, but come on, on board and do a couple anyway. So the reason I brought it up is what I found, I, the challenge was how to make, how to bring my personality, my, how to make a human connection to a story about the undead. So, and I, again, this sounds like a joke, but I mentioned this in the book, but, you know, I have personally never eaten another human <laughs> being, but, but I have uh, in, in my time been a slave to, you know, out of control cravings, which is part of Drew's character's problem in that script. So I could identify with that character. I could make a human connection. I could walk the walk a little bit of the undead. So that was part of the challenge with that show. And I think, uh, again, I, I, if I may, I think the stories that I directed are good in part because I kept my focus on, you know, what, how can I relate to this? What, what avenue can I find to relate to a story that's, you know, kind of weird and gruesome? And, 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 and again, going back to Ari, what you asked, I didn't think of it as a comedy. Of course, it's a comedy, but I didn't think of it that way. No. Because you're playing it for what the characters want and need. Playing it, yeah, playing it, playing it, just kind of keeping the stakes of those characters in mind. That's more important than wondering whether or not a, a, a moment is going to be funny or not. Mm -hmm. um, in in the book, you've got a great chapter about uh, leading the cast and crew with respect. Mm -hmm. um, and you mentioned that, you know, sometimes a director will find themselves working with very difficult people. Uh, which you put in uh, capitals and <laughs> you know you you i think possibly because you're a very diplomatic guy you choose not to dwell on that subject but what do you do when you despite all your best intentions you're stuck working with someone who's just plain difficult well there's a lot of there's a lot of ways to i mean i think part of what you need to realize if you're on the set and you'll have this experience, all of you will have this experience, there will be some people, there will be a few people who are just seem like weirdly difficult, like, why are you being like this? And, and, and the thing to remember is that that person, that very difficult person will be just as difficult in, at the checkout line in Trader Joe's as they mm -hmm. will on your set. So it has nothing to do with you. That's just, that's their, they're built that way. That's their, they're going to be, you know, so, so what that by reminding yourself of that you kind of like you, you kind of cut yourself some slack it's not you it's not anything you're doing this person is going to be that way that's their you know you're going to they're going to go home and be that way so that's that's part of it is just to kind of remind yourself of that the other part of it is to rem, to with actors and i've worked with you know challenging actors the most important thing is to to remember that they you know they have to they're much more vulnerable than you are. They have to like put themselves out there. They have to kind of bring certain emotions to the surface that I, could, I couldn't do it. I'm, I'm awed by the fact that actors can do this so well. But, that, but I think as a result, they are more delicate. And there are actors who will uh, really test you sometimes. And as a young director, it can make you feel very insecure. It's like, well, you know, I especially if you're you don't come with an acting background but i but again the the key thing is to remind yourself that you're the desi you're the designated storyteller and they're more nervous than you will ever be mm -hmm. and your job is not to act for them your job is just to tell a good story so what a lot of what you're going to do in terms of calming them or making them feel comfortable is not so it, 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 it's it's not about some it's just it, it's kind of reminding them in some subtle ways that you're the storyteller 
and there and and we're all on the same page telling this story um but anyways i that we could go on and on about difficult people for a long time uh, but i do th but i do think though well, let me talk about it a little bit more i do feel like please the you know the you are the director you set the tone on the set you set the tone so if you are I, you know, I don't need to tell you, you're all, you were all in, you know, you're, you're studying film, you know, wonderful, you know, legendary tales of directors who, who lead by negative reinforcement, who work mm -hmm. a crew to death to get a shot, who treat underlings poorly. It's, uh, sadly, those stories are, you know, part of film lore. I think it's not necessary. It's not, a, it, it's not a good way to lead a group of people. And I think it's much more exciting to, to set a tone where people feel acknowledged, safe, especially the actors, safe, to, free to play. And, and so, and I feel like, so to go back to your question about difficult people, a lot of that will fall by the wayside depend, if you set the tone for the set. It's just not going, to, it's not going to be part, you know, certain behaviors will simply not fit on that set. Mm -hmm because of the tone you set, you create. So anyways, that's, that's uh, admirable. Uh, she you? asks, uh, um, um, thank you so much for sharing your experiences. Any tips on directing dark comedy as compared to a broad ha ha comedy? Because you've certainly done both. Yeah, I'm trying to think of, um, well, dark comedy, I, I, I would say, again, going back to something like Larry Sanders for a second, I, I would say that it, for me personally, it's important to, um, to not be uh, judgmental toward characters who are behaving in a way that's bad. So there are characters in that show who really, you know, stab each other in the back, who, who, uh, who, who you know, are hypocritical, and, and, and I think part of what I tried, to, and I remember when I read the pilot and worked on the show at the beginning, there was a sense that um, I felt like rather than play into the archness of the writing or the archness of those characters, I would try my best to humanize them and make them uh, understandable and even relatable. So that even if you, if, if you, if you disagree with a choice on a character's part, you are still 100% rooting for them, weirdly enough. I mean, Which I think is the same thing that works with Michael Scott on The Office, oh, 100%. where he is yeah. the worst boss in the world, but you also love him because he's trying to be a good boss. He's just failing constantly. He, he's convinced he's a good boss. He's, and he's so committed to the idea, but everything that comes out of his mouth is so boneheaded. And, and um, but I think that, you know, it, there's a lot of, you know, I, I, there's so many wonderful, uh, I'll say series at the moment, you know, I, I was watching some Breaking Bad episodes. I mean, talk about a character that you root for who makes choices that are just kind of like so wrong, you know, it's, it's horrifying. It's, it's, it's kind of fantastic. But dark comedy, I, I would just say the key is to not to, to not be afraid to, to humanize and make those characters relatable. I'm trying to think of a great dark comedy. I don't know that I've really directed for instance, Tig Notaro's show, I wouldn't call it a dark comedy. It has very upsetting content, but it's, but it's very uh, much, you know, it, it, it's, not, it's not satire, it's, it's not black in that way. It, it's, not, it's not Dr. Strangelove. Um, yeah, I, I guess that kind of dark comedy, the, the, the kind of formal principle is that you're actually kind of putting a little of your humanity aside uh, so that you can take, you know, let the the part of your humanity you're not using to become subtext. That is, you know, uh, yep. you're, you're you're treating death as something funny when we know, of course, it's the least funny thing in the world. Yeah, I think that. Well, I think that the the again part of it is is if you can think about in any given moment. How you know whether whether you relate to a character's action or or or. The, the theme of it, it, it'll just naturally, you, you will kind of keep, put a human face on things that otherwise might seem kind of arch and, and two-dimensional. 
I mean, that's the thing. Just keep by up. always playing for the truth of the character. Yeah, I think that you can find that in you know, there there are, you know, uh, there there are great examples. But I actually think a film like Doctor Strangelove is a good example where each of those characters, you know, they're they're very broadly drawn, and some of them are performed more broadly than others, but they're all relatable. Every one of them. Every one of Even them. Even General Jack D. Ripper. Even Jack and D. His Ripper. obsession with purity of essence he, he has a, he's committed to a point of view he's mm -hmm. committed to a point of view at the you know even though it's in, an insane point of view you respect his commitment yep. and you like him for that actually yep uh kinder asks uh um thank you for coming and uh do you have any advice for aspiring writers and producers who want to create a pilot and how best to approach a director who's more established can they even do that well, I, I mean, I think that you can always, there are always ways to get your work out there. I, 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 that would be a longer conversation. And, but I would say the thing that you want to think about is once you get the work into someone's hands or once you get into a room with a director or, or producer, it's like, what, is, what, what are you selling really? And, and again, this is gonna, I may sound like a stuck record here, but I think that your, your job direct, you know, create, if you're out creating a pilot, like let's say you just came into my office and wanted to tell me about it. The thing that would impress me, here's what would, here's what would make the difference for me is A, if you're passionate about it, as opposed to coming in and say, hey, I got this idea for a comedy. There's five friends and they live in this apartment building. We'll call it friends. That that's not interesting. That of course it was popular. That doesn't mean anything. What's more interesting is if you came in and say, "This is a story about me. I went through this. I have to tell this story. I'd love for you to be part of it." By the way, if you're not going to be part of it, if you're not going to buy it, that's fine because I'm going to make it. I'm going to find somebody else to do it. I would say, "Okay, tell me more." And passion so that, always rules. Passion leads leads wins the day. But also again. You would be surprised, I think, to find that a lot of, uh, I'll just talk about half hour comedies for a second, are very personal. Not, not, I'm not talking about the Tignataros of the world, but like even a show, a show I'm very proud of that I worked on a bunch, Malcolm in the Middle. Mm -hmm. Malcolm in the Middle, the, the creator of the show, Linwood Boomer, it wasn't, I'm going to come up with an idea about a family where the middle kid is, you know, a bit of a prodigy. When he went into the you know networks, he said, "I was that. I'm that character. I was Malcolm in my family. The, all the rest of the people in my family seemed like idiots. I was the only one who knew what was going on. This is my story." So, like right from the get go, it it, it gives you as the writer a certain authority. No one's going to say, "Oh, good idea. Let's assign it to so and so." It's like, no, it's yours. That's it. So, and it not could that only have come from men. Yeah. And then, not by the way, not that everything needs to be that personal, but but by I would say by and large, if you come in, um, I mean when I when I this is not a writer's about writing, but when I met to direct the films, The Sisterhood of the Traveling Pants, I opened my pitch by saying, I go look at I I am not a sixteen year old girl, and I am not remotely part of the demographic that this film is aimed at, but I so related to each of the emotional challenges that these four girls face, and here's why, this, this, this. So suddenly it, it was again, what gave me a leg up in the room was not that I had some teen girl you know, bona fides, hmm. or bona fides, how do you pronounce that word? I don't know. Bona fides, yeah. <laughs> um, bona fides, but that I, uh, but that I, made someone confident that I could put something human on the screen at the end. Mm -hmm. So, and, and, and the reason that I made them feel confident is because it came from, again, it, I've been, you know, been there, done that, put foot in mouth, you know, et cetera. And so if, if you're, so pitching that pilot idea, again, it may not be something that's drawn from your personal experience, but it will be enhanced if you figure out a way to, that, that to bring your personality to it and sell yourself, you know, as the reason to buy this idea. So, you know, it's, it's, uh, you know. That is such important advice. Yeah. And, 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 it, and you'd be surprised. It will change the nature. It'll change the tenor of that meeting. 
it, it's not like you know here's a concept it's like no no this happened to me i need to get this story off my chest i'm going to tell it one way or the other <laughs> so i was yeah. like that's it um well people uh, throw out some more questions i've got one for you which is uh yeah. Uh, in the book, you've got a great chapter about what T.S. Eliot called the objective correlative uh, when you uh, invest an object with story power, basically. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and uh, you, you cite some great examples from uh, movie history, like the hat in Lubitsch's Nanotchka mm -hmm. or the car in the narrow parking space in Koran's Roma. But are there some examples from your own work of when you found an objective correlative, when you found a way to invest I... an object with story power? Well, you know what? Can I repeat my story Please. about Pam and Jim's desks? Please. Actually, better yet, can I take over the screen for a second? You can do anything you want. Well, I can't do anything. But what I'm going to do, do I, was a, I was a guest a couple of months ago on this podcast. I wonder uh, if they, I, I wonder if it'll let you, I, I may have to oh, make you a co-host. Oh, oh, no, I can do it. Oh, no, no, I you, can okay. do it. Okay, great. Oh, we tried it. Uh, I'm going to show you a clip. There's a picture of my dog. My dog. So this is me talking on. This is a. Uh, there was a pod. There's a podcast. Your office fans may know it. It's called Office Ladies. Mm -hmm. And this is. We just went through this about Pam and Jim's desk. But I just want to go through. This is for me an example of the objective correlative. I do remember spending a lot of time thinking about the relationship between Pam's chair and and Jim's chair. I mean Pam's. You know, your your reception area was always where it was, but it was a question of where would Jim sit? And it seems now like, how could it not be what it was? But I love the idea that you always look at Jim and Jim has to turn to look at you. It's like the simplest thing, but I thought that somehow the way your desk's related would help tell the Pam Jim story. And nothing makes me happier than some of the shots we did where like John's in profile in the foreground and you're in the background jenna like gazing at him and he either is unaware that you're looking at him or he's completely pretending to be unaware and he knows yes. very well that you're looking at him so i feel like that was actually something uh, that was like a key moment in setting setting up the dunder mifflin world so again forgive me it's kind of something we already talked about but i thought it'd be fun to show you the images yeah for me that is that is an example of an objective correlative it, it is an objective correlative for the the tension between those two characters the romantic tension between them i i i um i love this i, I this concept was a new concept to me and, and for all of you out there you know it is i i again one more reason to peek at this book is it's kind of a cool idea that you know that a prop can have a through line or that a piece of wardrobe like Nanachka's hat or I was talking to someone the other day about Walter White and Breaking Bad his pork pie hat is an objective correlative you can really kind of talk about his relationship simply by talking about the hat at times um, so I love the idea that space or desks or you know furniture itself can you know tell the story um I, I i can't it's i'm excited to it's a it was a fairly new discovery this concept so i'm excited to try and apply it more as a director as, as i go on um uh, we'll have a couple more questions kinder has another question uh what is a pet peeve of yours that could make you not want to direct a script or a potential are there potential narrative red flags that you look out to be aware of well again this may sound like I'm a little repetitious, but I often read comedy scripts that are very uh, uh, funny, but they're they're funny on the surface, and I can't figure out who the people are or why I should be invested in them. And you can get kind of fooled at times. You know, they're, they're, you know, people saying witty things is not the same as being involved in a story. You know, it's funny. This is a random thought that a random thing I just thought of. I, I, I'm friends with the people who worked on the film, The Big Chill. I don't know if I hope many of you have seen it. It's a wonderful sure. film. And but one of the people who worked on it is the editor, Carol Littleton, with whom I've worked. And she told me a great story. Of course, once. and uh, she's married to John Bailey, who you've John also Bailey. worked with quite a lot. And uh, they both taught here, by the way. Oh, they did. Well, Car Carol yeah. taught The Big Chill. And she told me a story about two previews of the film. Um, the first night, the same cut, 
the first night they showed it to a preview audience and people laughed at every funny line. And, and the, the, the powers that be and the filmmakers thought, wow, this is fantastic. We're having the best preview screening. And then they got the scores and the written feedback and it was okay. It was fine, but it wasn't great. And so they were a little puzzled. They previewed it again the following night. This time the audience was quiet throughout most of the film. They weren't laughing. And, and then their scores and their feedback were hugely positive. So it's like they weren't laughing because they were involved. So it wasn't that they were laughing at that thing that's on the surface. They got involved in a way. So for me, my pet peeve would be is, is just not, it's not a pet peeve or a red flag so much as I try to make sure that I'm not being fooled by a script that may has maybe has some nice bells and whistles, but maybe doesn't have a lot going on under the skin. It's funny, something that William Goldman uh, writes in one of his books that he had kind of a career trough where he thought the word was out in the industry. Go, watch out for Goldman. He fools you with good writing. <laughs> That's a great, I love that. Uh, but I do think it's easy to, you know, sometimes it's, again, maybe more with comedies than not. But, you know, sometimes you can be fooled by something that, that seems uh, funny, but it, again, it doesn't really have enough going, enough. I don't want to say heart. That makes it, that's a weird word, but just doesn't have enough going on under the surface. That's all. It's a good question. What are you working on right now? Is there anything coming up that we should look out for? I'll tell you, I, I have a project I've been, uh, a feature project I've been working on for quite some time that I'm hoping I can get off the ground. I, I'm, I'm, I, I'm going to direct a, a film about the real life band, The Shags. Oh, that's great. The Shags were three uh, sisters, the Wiggins sisters. They, were, they grew up in a small town in New Hampshire, Fremont, New Hampshire, and they were singularly uh, untalented. Musically, they had no talent at all. They couldn't sing, they couldn't play instruments, but their father had this vision that they could become rock and, of rock and like stars. And so he pulled, this is true, he pulled them out of school. He had them homeschooled. He, he, he bought them these cheap instruments. He insisted they come up with songs. He forced them to play at this little town hall once a Saturday. And all of that led to the father raising enough money to take the three girls to Boston where they rented a recording studio and, and recorded an album's worth of songs. And it is without a doubt, one of the oddest records ever. And it is one of the oddest things ever committed to vinyl. And there were like a few hundred copies pressed, they all disappeared. And in the late 1970s, early eighties, a, a rock and roller in Los Angeles like found one in the back of some bargain bin and the cover itself, just look up the cover of the Shags album. It's so fantastic. Philosophy of the world. Philosophy of the world. And he was so like mystified by it. He bought it. And then he was doubly like, what the heck is this? And he called his then friend, Frank Zappa, who listened to it, who, and who basically said, proclaimed, well, this is, this is outsider art. And they reissued the record. And over the past you know, 30 plus years, it has grown in stature and, and is, is it, when I bought it, I was a, it, a graduate student and it, I used to use it to get people to leave my apartment. <laughs> it's, 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 so, it's so appalling. And it's like, so it's like you listen to it and it feels like were these three girls raised in a cave? Like what is going on here? But, but I think younger uh, people, meaning younger musicians in particular have really embraced this record as an example of like, you know, honest, sincere, super personal, painfully personal. And, 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 and it's so anyways, I'm trying to uh, make a movie about them. Two of the three That's sisters fantastic. are with us. And wow. I've been, uh, it's been hard. I hope I get it off the ground. And I'm really, I'm really proud of this one. I hope I can pull it off. So look forward to seeing that. Uh, Max has a question. Uh, speaking about your upcoming personal projects, how do you balance working for others, working for yourself, and working on multiple projects at one time? Do you have any guiding principles about moving forward with each project? Well, I do think it's important to figure out if you're working for other people, it's important to kind of make sure that part in the mix is also something that you're doing for yourself. And, that, and for me, that's what this was. I mean, nobody, I didn't have to report to anyone. 
There was no studio executive. I just, I just, it was like, wow, what a, whew, what a refreshing thing. I, and I really tried my best in writing it to not, I don't care. I don't care if anyone reads it. I don't care. I'm just going to try and get it down. And it was, so I think that when you're as a director in particular or a writer, if you're writing something, you're on a staff or if you're writing on commission, uh, you should try and again, please alternate that with something that's only for you, only for you. And if you're a director, come up with some something to write or create that's just for you that nobody's, no one's, you don't want to have any negative self-talk. You can see I've been to therapy for decades. No <laughs> negative self-talk while you're doing the things that are for you. <laughs> so that's easier said than done sometimes. I know, I'm not, I'm not it, it, but I do think it's, uh, in terms of multiple projects, uh, we should all be so lucky. Uh, but again, I feel like in terms of, you know, again, yeah, be a gun for hire and also do things that are for you. Balance those, these should balance. I wish I did more of it that way. I, I wish, in, you know, I don't regret anything, but I wish I did more of, I wish I operated more in that way. So. And now you are. I'm, I'm, you just done it. I did it. <laughs> well, Ken, I cannot thank you enough for being here and, and talking to us so uh, candidly and, and openly. Um, and once again, cannot stress uh, enough, read the book, get the book. Uh, um, so I'll put the uh, um, details on the book in the chat. And uh, thank you so much. I, this was so great. I so appreciate getting to meet all of you. Thanks for your questions. Great questions. And uh, I, I wish you the best with the rest of the semester. I know these are tough times to be a film production person, um, but please the best of luck figuring it out. And again, I, I, if you have of a mind, I think you'll enjoy this book. So please take a peek. Thank you so much, Ken. Thanks everybody. Thank you. See y'all. Thank you all. Bye. -bye.